changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. If you go back to verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God. Now, now when we think of man's wrath, we think of oh, you know, coming down on something and just you know, taking care of it. But this is the wrath of God. And if you read in verse 24, it says, Therefore God gave them up. He withdrew. What happens when God withdraws? There's a there's a story on the internet, not the internet, Facebook, same thing, internet, Facebook. I'm not gonna tell the whole story, but it, it, it made a great point to me, and, I, and I'm just gonna briefly tell the story. It's not a really, it's just a, a comparison. The apps. What is uh, what? What's coal? Some of y'all heard this. It was. It was attributed to Albert Einstein arguing with a teacher. And I'm going to, I'm going to leave. So coal, is, our pastor said, is the absence of heat. So there's really no such thing as coal. It's just the absence of heat. And, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a bottom temperature that, I, I can't remember, it's like 497 or something below zero. If you can think about that. That's like way past ice cube. <laughs> yes, uh, so the absence of coal, I mean, excuse me, the absence of heat is cold. It's not cold, it's not the opposite of hot. Sorry, Susan, I, I really don't mean to put the phone. I just suddenly moved. So what is uh, the definition of, of uh, dark? The absence of light. So there's there's different there's divisions, but when you bring in light, what happens to the dark? So the uh, light and darkness are not opposites. Light, excuse me, darkness is the opposite of, me, darkness is the absence of light. What is evil? Evil is the absence of God. So when God withdraws Himself, what takes up the vacuum? Evil. Amen. So this this is what, what what we have here. This is the whole problem. Adam and Eve when they when they did what they weren't supposed to do, they ate the forbidden fruit. What happened to Adam and Eve? The darkness came in. Adam and Eve were hiding from God. They said because, why, God says, why are you hiding? And Adam says, because we're naked. I don't know if Adam really knew the concept of not having clothes. I think Adam was talking about, he was spiritually mm -hmm. naked. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit had removed from Adam. Mm -hmm. So look at our world today, the schools, you name it. You look at it. Look at, and I'm not pointing my fingers at you. I'm pointing my fingers at me. Look at your own heart. Look in your own heart. And, and, and the illustration I just gave, use that in your own heart. So, the gospel... Is God's solution to the sin problem. So when we study, when we start to study, I'm talking about, I'm not talking, now, there's different ways, you know, everybody has their way to come to God, and you know, we got stories and everything, and uh, they say, you got to do this and you got to do that, and I say no. And I always point them to the thief on the cross, every time. I said, look at the thief on the cross. What happened to the thief on the cross? He didn't say, come into me, Holy Spirit. He just, he made a, a decision in his heart. And the Holy Spirit came in.
Changed his life right there. Too often we try to understand our, the, the solution which is prepared for us in Christ, which is the gospel, without first recognizing the full extent of the sin problem, of the problem which is sin. Only when we truly understand our complete sinfulness in both nature and action will we truly understand God's solution. Without that, what good? I mean, why do you why do you need a gospel if you don't understand that you're you're sick? I'm talking to myself too, don't. <laughs> Not until we understand the depraved nature of sin will we lose all confidence in self. Does the world teach this message? What the world teach? To be self-sufficient. Turn to Christ as our only righteousness. The gospel becomes meaningful then only against the background of a full understanding of sin. Okay, the origin of sin. We all know where the origin of sin. We know where the origin of sin was Lucifer who decided that he wanted to be God. That is where the original sin, that's where the, orig the origin of sin started. The Bible doesn't explain how sin could arise in a perfect being. It's in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. It says that, that, that it is the, a mystery of iniquity. It, sin is a mystery. The essence of Lucifer's sin was self-exaltation. He wanted to exalt himself above God's throne. And this, I please listen to this with your heart. I'm going to listen to this with my heart too. I've read it many a time. Self-centeredness, the love of self, is the underlying principle of all sin. Not some sin. I want to read that one more time. Self-centeredness, the love of self, is the underlying principle of all sin. Let that go into your heart. It, it is... That's this thing. I want everybody to hear this. It is in complete opposition to the principle of self-sacrificing love which is the foundation of God's character and government. Sin then is basically rebellion against God and His self-sacrificing love. Lucifer's sin eventually had got him kicked out of heaven and God did not want to allow sin to develop in heaven. So he allowed it to come here. Don't ask. I don't, I don't understand why this is the great sin experiment. I don't understand it. But God says he allowed it to come here. God created this earth for man and gave him dominion over it. Everything was perfect. Sin did not exist any, in anything God created. Now, remember we talked about when he asked God to leave, and what happened? Evil came in. Evil came in. Lucifer turned Satan, tempted our first parents, Adam and Eve. He caused them to fall out of their perfect state. Satan took possession of this world. He became the prince of the power of the air, is what Scripture calls him. And when, and when Satan was tempting Jesus after he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he offered Jesus the, the, uh, the world. And Jesus did not argue with him. He didn't say, well, the world's not your Satan. Jesus said, all right. So that, that's another story. Paul calls uh, 
uh, Satan in 2 Corinthians 4 4, he calls him the God of this age. We are born self centered. And this is another thing we need to really listen to. We, me and me, and you, are born self centered, and our natural inclination is to want to live independently of God. The whole world is under Satan's control except for those who have given themselves to Christ. Remember before I started this sermon, I told you that God loves you very much. Don't forget that. The whole world is under Satan's control. It doesn't say part of the world. It says the whole world. There's a mask that Satan carries and he has on. And we as human beings cannot see it without Christ. If you think that you're living your life and enjoying it and everything's you know, great going on, you're being deceived. <coughs> I'm being deceived. Using fallen human beings as his tools, Satan has developed a kingdom that is based entirely on self-seeking. Look around this world. The Bible refers to it as the kingdom of the world. It is in complete opposition to God's kingdom of heaven. Everything that goes to make this world system, politics, education, that's a bad word, politics, education, Commerce, recreation, sports, social clubs, technology, nationalism is founded on Satan's principles of self-love. I mean, where's this world going? Look around. Without exception, all that is in the world is based upon lust and the principles of self-love. This is... This is not pretty. Because Satan is a liar and a deceiver. And I want you to hear this with all your heart. Because Satan is a liar and a deceiver. Much that is in the world appears to be good. All that is in the world is part of Satan's kingdom of self-love. For 6,000 years, God has allowed Satan to have his way, developing sin on earth. But the time will come when Satan and his kingdom will be exposed and destroyed forever. Amen. Satan and his kingdom must be destroyed. But God has a way to escape for, fallen, for the fallen human race is held captive by Satan. This is the good news, the gospel that God wants everyone to understand. He wants everyone to receive. From the foundation of the world, He has prepared His heavenly kingdom for us. Where is our kingdom? Is it of this world? His heaven, see, the destroying fires of hell are intended only for the devil and his angels. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. All those who respond in faith to God's love, manifested in the gift of His Son, will be delivered from the condemnation that is resting on Satan and his kingdom. And I want to go into some basic definitions of sin and then I'll close. The Bible uses 12 different Hebrew words in the Old Testament to define sin, and five in the New Testament. That's 17 words for sin. We don't have time to go through all of them. There, these 17 sins fit into uh, three categories. Uh, they fit together in three basic concepts. 
All three of these are expressed in Psalm 51, verses 2 and 3. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. The word iniquity. The root meaning for the word is crooked or bent. Scripture uses it to describe our natural condition. Our natural condition is, is crooked or bent. Scripture it uses it to describe our natural spiritual condition. The term iniquity does not primarily refer to an act of sin, but it refers to a condition of sinfulness. We, this is Isaiah 53, 6. We all, and that's all of us, me included, like sheep have gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the, the iniquity of us all. This verse makes two points. First, everyone has gone astray because we have followed the natural bent of our own way. Second, this bent to follow our own way, the self-centeredness is the iniquity that was laid upon Christ, our sin bearer. Isaiah 64, 6. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Every thing that you have done for God is talking about this. Everything that you've done in Christ doesn't fit this category. There's a difference there. Everything you've done is filthy rags. Everything you've done in Christ is is a gift. Okay. There's so much more I could say on that, but I want you to use your imaginations. If I point my finger, I have three or four pointing back at me. We need to examine ourselves before God. Not your neighbor. Yourselves. Examine yourselves before God. As David said, see if there's any unclean ways in me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, oh God. Because we are sinful at birth. All the righteousness we produce through our own efforts, are like filthy rags before God. It is polluted with self-love. It's hard to think about. In contrast to filthy garments of our own self-righteousness, in Zechariah 3, verses 3 and 4, Christ offers us the white robe of His righteousness. Matthew 7, verses 22 and 23. We should probably, probably heard this many times. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? These are the saddest thing, words I think I've ever heard. And I, and, and I never want you to hear them. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. The judgment will expose in, as iniquity our self-righteousness. Our self-righteous acts. Even those done in the name of Christ. All the nice things we've done in the name of Christ will be when he says, Away from me, you evil doers. 
And we've done these things in His name. Do our works originate from Christ and therefore spring from the motive of self-sacrificing love? Do we do things out of self-sacrificing love or do we have a hook in everything we do? You do this for me, I'll do this for you. God is asking us to love unconditionally. That's without reciprocating each other. He's asking us, to, uh, uh, that, that's a hard thing to do. God's telling us to love our enemies. He's, he's asking us to love. He doesn't tell us. He asks us. God's asking us to love our enemies. Are they works of faith? the result of genuine re relationship with Christ? Are we working in His name without really knowing Him? Do we do, any, do, we do things in Christ's name without, without really knowing Him? The second definition of sin, the second, it, is, it is sin. And this word sin, it means to miss the mark. I'm sure most of you heard that definition of sin, to miss the mark. Spiritually, this means falling short of the glory of God. Or failing to, to measure up to His ideals of selfless love. Since we are born, in, uh, since we are born very spiritually bent, if we're born spiritually bent, then we have to see how it's difficult to see how how. how how are we going to get from, since we're spiritually bent and selfish, how do we get from being selfish to unselfish? I am crucified with Christ. It's not me. It's Him. If God is your co-pilot, you need to switch seats. Our sinful condition, our iniquity, makes it impossible for us to do anything but miss the divine mark unless we have a Savior. The third word is transgression. This word means deliberate violation of the law, a willful act of disobedience. It, is, it presupposes that we have a knowledge of the law means we know where we're going and how we're, we're going into this with the, mind, with the mind that I don't care. I am going to sin. This is a deliberate transgression. Adam had, he deliberately transgressed. And I want to close with that. Adam is our father. He's not just our, he's not our spiritual father. He's our father. And my best illustration for that, and, and y'all probably heard it before, and I just got to say it again for those who haven't heard it. It's like the apple seed. I think I got an apple seed. It's like this, this single apple seed. Every apple that comes from this seed has the genetic code of this seed. So every apple after that has the same genetic code. Adam and Eve, Adam, who is our, who was made, every human being came from Adam. So every human being has the same genetic code as Adam. So what Adam did comes to, to, his, to all the people that follow after him. Same as the apple seed has a genetic code. So everything that, that pertains to Adam pertains to me. So when it says that sin passed, this is Romans 5.18. My favorite verse. Therefore, as through one man's offense, that one man is Adam, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even though through one man's righteous act, Jesus Christ, Read. 
The free gift came to all men, resulting in condemnation of life. So what Adam did, Jesus Christ reversed. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, and we are the whosoever. Does that mean the whole human race is going to be saved? No, because there are those of us that, that don't believe it. So what Adam did My apple seed. The apple seed is the human race. This is Jesus Christ. At the incarnation of Christ, when, when Jesus took on human flesh, Adam was put into Christ. And the human race is now in Christ. Whether you believe it or not. Examine yourselves, my brothers and sisters. Our closing song is song number 340.